announcements, but first of all, just wanted to welcome you uh, to Brainerd Baptist Church, especially on this rainy and cold morning. We're so glad you're here. Um, just a few announcements for you. Um, you know, with the new service times changes, we've got a lot of different life groups at different times. Um, you can, if you need some information, if you are not quite plugged into a life group yet, um, out in the area in the front of the BX here, um, there's information can be found um, by the yellow banners that are near the coffee in both venues. But for those of you that are here in the BX, you can find that. Um, I do want to let you know about next Sunday on February the 19th at 5 o'clock will be our quarterly business meeting in the sanctuary. Um, and this is when we discuss uh, the business matters of the church. Um, if you're a member of Brainerd Baptist Church, we want to really encourage you to be present and just be a part of this. Um, also, on another note, we are going to be celebrating after uh, the business meeting, Martha King. Uh, for many of you that have been around here for a while, uh, Martha has been the church pianist for 40 years and is going to be retiring. Uh, so we want to celebrate her and just love on her after the business meeting, and that'll take place downstairs in the fellowship hall immediately after the meeting next Sunday evening. Uh, for students uh, that are in the room, this is especially for you. Um, D-NOW weekend, registration is open. Um, it's going to be held on March the 17th through the 19th, beginning at 6 p.m. that Friday until about noon on Sunday. Um, during the church service, there will be a lot of sleepy heads <laughs> uh, from, our, from our youth uh, members. But students uh, will actually be dropped off in host homes that you'll be notified about beginning at 6 on Friday for dinner. And then they'll go to and from the BX uh, really, um, and their host homes throughout their weekend. The cost is $50. Uh, the theme this year is this changes everything. Um, what is the gospel? Does it really have the power to change lives? Uh, so I want to encourage all students, uh, I believe grades 6 through 12, if I'm wrong, Paul will let me know, um, but uh, just to really consider being a part of this, uh, the speaker this year is going to be our own Paul Lasso, who is the campus pastor for North Georgia. Um, but registration does close on February 25th. So just kind of keep that date in mind. Um, I want to ask everybody, if you will, stand up, greet some folks around you, say hello, um, and then we will begin our worship shortly. you are finding your way to your seats, um, please remain standing. I want to read a passage of scripture to call us to worship today. If we haven't yet met, uh, I'm Curtis. If I didn't get to meet you before, I'd love to meet you afterwards. I'll be in the, the lobby there. This is like our focus for our service today. Matthew 11 says, Jesus speaking, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So it's actually an invitation, and I want to extend that invitation. I think it's the invitation of Jesus. So Jesus would say to all of us, to everyone who is filled with anxiety and needs peace, to everyone who walked in this room searching for the truth in the middle of a com very confusing world, for all those who feel like they're running hard and still not making any progress, for those who are grieving and need God's comfort, for those who sin and need a savior, grateful to be a part of a church that opens our doors and welcomes you in. And I hope you don't think it's trite, but I can say like, Jesus is glad you're here. We're in his presence. We're going to sing. We're going to sing about him. We're going to sing to him. 
So I want to thank you for being a part of our worship service. This is an invitation, not just to listen to, but participate as we sing to the God who is greater than all. Let's sing, church.
We're going to do a new song this morning. And it's, it's a beautiful song. It's called What He's Done. And when you think about, if someone asks you right now, what has Jesus done for you? I think most people in the room would happily, joyfully say, he died for me. He defeated death for me. He has made a place for me to be with him in eternity. Amen. That's a beautiful thing. But what about all those other beautiful things that come along with that? He has won freedom for us. We are overcomers because he overcame first. There are all these beautiful things. And so this is a song of celebration to just give him praise for what he has done. All the glory and the honor to Jesus.
for uh, joining us. Before you sit down, I think there's a few people who may still be looking for a seat and they don't want to make the walk to the front row up here. And so if you could just scoot kind of to the middle of whichever area that you're in, I think there's some seats there and then you can go ahead and, and be seated. We want to thank you for coming to worship with us today. You braved uh, the wet and the cold and uh, you have already came and offered uh, songs of worship to your Lord. Uh, this is a time during our service where we also uh, offer him our, our resources, who we are. And you can give at Brainerd Baptist Church by giving online, going to our website. There's a little blue box in the back as you exit. You can also come and drop off uh, your, your gifts uh, at the church office anytime that during our normal office hours. We are so thankful that you're here. Uh, because uh, the way that we worship, because of the way that we sing to the Lord, because of our love for Him, because of the way that we give our resources to Him, the uh, mission that we have at Brainerd of helping those that are far from God become committed followers of Jesus from the scenic city to the nation, that mission can be completed uh, because of what you do. And we want to say thank you for that. In just a moment, you're going to see a video that talks about uh, how uh, we're doing missions, how we're making disciples all the way to the ends of the earth. And then after that, Pastor Curtis is going to come 
uh, open the word and lead us. And so I want to pray uh, right now uh, for this moment, for what we've already experienced, giving thanks to the Lord and for what's still yet to come. So if you would, please join me in prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. You are worthy, Lord, of all that we can give you, Lord, whether that is our voice or whether that is our resources, whether it is our energy. God, you are worthy of it all, and Lord, we want to give it to you. And Father, we pray, Lord, for every resource uh, that's given, uh, for every offering and tithe that, that's put, uh, to, Lord, to your service, God, that you would use it and multiply it for your glory. Father, we pray for, uh, for Pastor Curtis as he comes and leads us into your word. God, that we would not hear from him, but we'd hear from you. And God, that you would have your hand on him as he leads us uh, to hear your voice. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. A copy of God's word. Can we take it and turn to John chapter 13? John chapter 13, as you're turning. Um, so grateful you're here. Again, uh, reference was made. I'm beginning to think uh, January and February are nothing but rainy days every single day, but I'm grateful for your attendance here and grateful for the worship leaders as well as uh, First Impressions, the AV crew that uh, are helping to serve so many people. So many hands are invested in this. I'm grateful for kids ministry workers as well. So um, thank you, Brainerd family. We're going to be looking at John 13. So we're going through a series where we're looking at Jesus speaking to his disciples in the upper room. Today I'm going to be reading beginning in verse 31. So John 13 and verse 31. Scripture says this, when he, being Judas, had left, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you a little while longer, and you will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you where I'm going, you cannot come. I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Can we pray? So, Father, we know we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of your mouth. So I pray there would just be a hungry appetite, not for clever words, not just for a few tips of how to live our lives a little bit better, but I pray there would be a hunger to hear the words of Jesus Christ. And by your spirit, take those words, plant them into our lives so that we look different and we talk different and we act different and we love different because we've heard them. We ask these requests in Jesus' name. Amen. So you know, as well as I do, a lot of times movies begin with an initial scene and the initial scene will basically set the stage. Maybe a few of the main characters are going to be introduced. And a few situations that are, you kind of got to get the gist of the original, that initial scene, so that you understand the rest of the movie, the rest of the plot line as it unfolds. I believe that's a little bit of what happens at the beginning of John 13. We talked about this last week. We're not going to go over it completely again, but there is kind of this initial glance that John wants us to know what's going on when it comes to his, Jesus and his disciples, what he says. So one of the things John wants to make sure we know is how much Jesus loves his disciples. And so everything we read in John 13 and 14 and 15 and 16, everything that we read is going to be kind of cast with this vision that Jesus loves his disciples all the way to the end. And I don't believe that's just the original 12. I'm looking at disciples that Jesus loves. So as we hear his word, we don't have to wonder whether he's mad at us, whether he's angry at us, whether he's disinterested. We know he loves us. But verse 2 of John 13 also kind of casts a, a glimpse into the rest of the chapter as well, saying Jesus knew that it was his just about, just about time for him to depart. 
And so everything we read also in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is going to be with this view of Jesus knowing his time had come and he is getting ready to depart. So these set the table. The verses I read a moment ago, kind of with that table set, they're really going to teach us some things about two subjects, and that is glory and love. Glory and love. By the time we get to verse 31, and hopefully you still have your Bibles open there. By this time, Judas has left. He is left to, Scripture says it's dark, and it's kind of a picture, isn't it? There's a darkness about the whole scene. He is left to betray Jesus, to hand Jesus over to his enemies. And that is when Jesus says, I want you to notice the word. It should be in bold. Now the Son of Man is glorified. And God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. The word you saw repeated and repeated and repeated is the word glory. And I want you to see, I want us to grasp, even as Jesus speaks in love, preparing his disciples for his departure, glory is seen in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Glory is seen. Which I, I would guess we better get clear on something, and that is exactly what does glory mean? It's used five times in that passage. Glory or glorify is used five times just in those Short amount of verses that I read. So I find that glory is one of those words, kind of a church word, Bible word, where we kind of have an idea what it means, but it, it can be a little bit fuzzy. We may not have like specific clarity and, and some definition of exactly what the Bible speaks of when it talks about glory. So if you read ancient languages, the idea of glory is something even like a weight, something heavy something valuable, something heavy. But it's not just that. It's also this idea of, but it, you can see it or, or it's evident. So there's an idea of some weightiness that has a radiance about it. As a matter of fact, um, kind of putting a few things together, I have this description of God's glory and part of it is like, it's just cobbled together a little bit of home cooking here as far as this description. I think that a little bit of John Piper's mixed in here as well. But a description of God's glory is his infinite worth, the infinite worth of his perfections, and I could use the word attributes, but when you're talking about God, it's not merely that he has attributes. Everything about God is perfect. All of what makes God God, all of who God is, the infinite worth, the infinite value of all that, gone public, put on display. Glory it's a description. It's probably not even a, a full definition, but at least it's a description that helps my mind process when I read the gl word glory a bunch of times. Okay, what exactly is it talking? It's the infinite worth, God's glory, infinite worth of his perfections put on display. So when you take that and you map that back on this passage, so verse 31, we go back to it. So the Son of Man, verse 31, Jesus says, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, it's his favorite title, the Son of Man is glorified. So that means the infinite worth of Jesus' perfections are getting ready to be put on display. And then it says, in the second part of verse 31, God is glorified in the Son. So the infinite worth of the Father's perfections are getting ready to go on display. But then there is this statement in verse 32, kind of God is glorified in the Son, and the glorifies himself in the Son. There's a shared glory. You know, interesting, and if you read in Isaiah 42, 8. So Isaiah 42, 8 says, God speaking, I am the Lord. That is my name, and I don't share my glory with anybody else. And yet here, we have very clearly the Father and Son sharing glory mutually putting their perfections on display. Just one more reminder of the oneness of father and son. One more reminder of that. And what Jesus says is that's happening at once. Like Jesus is saying, now the son of man is glorified. So the events that are going to follow as we read the rest, as we read out the book of John, the rest of the events that follow, including 
the death, burial, resurrection, and initial ascension of Jesus. All those are showing God's perfections. They're putting those on display. There's glory in the death and resurrection of Jesus. If you go back to Isaiah, so Isaiah wrote hundreds of years before Jesus came. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 53 that there would come a time when the Lord would reveal his strong arm. He would go public with his strength. And in Isaiah 53, we find out exactly what that's going to look like. He speaks of the servant that's coming, speaking specifically of Jesus, and says, if you want to see how strong and how mighty the glory of the Lord, the the glory of his perfections, the radiance of his perfections, the infinite worth of his perfections put on display, then actually you're going to have to look at the servant who was wounded for our transgressions, who was crushed for us. Isaiah is preparing us for what Jesus speaks. Jesus says, I'm about to go to the cross, and as I hang on there, that cross, you're going to see God's glory. You're going to see the infinite value of what it means to be forgiven. You're going to see the infinite worth of what it means for atonement to be made, for us to be reconciled, for adoption to be completed. This is glory. Glory is seen in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The tragedy is, though, church, the tragedy is the world doesn't see it. The world looks for glory in a million places, looks at the cross and says, I don't see much in that. And that's not the only tragedy. The tragedy is also that we, as followers of Jesus, sometimes lose, lose sight of the fact of the glory of Jesus, the glory of God seen in the death, burial, and resurrection. Our world, like humans, we want glory, so we chase it. We need it. We try to find it in some place where we live in a glory-hungry world. We're, we're after, I mean, this is just part of being human. You're, you're after something that says, like, this is valuable. This is, like, everybody should pay attention to this. This has some weight to it. And so there's so many knockoffs and counterfeits of this. So there's all sorts of celebrity news saying, like, this is a big deal. Everybody pay attention. There's all sorts of political gossip. There are sports events and concerts that are going to say, like, this is a big, big deal. And then there are going to be those tweets and those Instagram posts that go viral for all of about five minutes. And the world's going to go, oh, this is such a big deal. This is so important. Everybody needs to see it. Everybody needs to know it. And then it's going to fade just like that. We chase it. We chase so hard after glory. We chase glory, and companies and advertisers are kind of willing to like, put us in front of a mirror and say, you know who should be glorified? You should be. So literally hundreds of millions of dollars are going to be spent on advertisement tonight for the Super Bowl. And a lot of it is going to be a mirror kind of turned around saying, you ought to be, you ought to be glorified. You ought to have the most glory. Everybody ought to see all of your strengths and all of your attributes, and that ought to be put on display. Everybody should know that. Everybody should see that. And you're going to be pumped with that message saying it's all about you. It's all about your glory. It's all about people knowing who you are. And we do start to buy in. Oh, there are a lot of different ways. We kind of think, you know, if I get this certain job and I can have this certain title on my business card, then, like, then that will give me value and worth and people will know it and see it. For others, it, it may come like if, if I land that dream job, if I get accepted to the school oh, that everybody else wants to get accepted to, if I get that, then everybody will kind of see I worked hard and I'm, I'm, I'm competent and I'm capable. Or maybe for you, it's more like if I get that perfect Christmas card picture, then everybody will know and see my family's all come together just the way I wanted it to come. Or maybe for you, there's something else. And for some of us, like we don't feel like we have glory, but we chase it. We chase it hard. We think if I have the perfect home, the perfect job, the perfect retirement, the perfect body, the perfect whatever, 
Like then I will feel like I have something that can be put on display for everybody to see. We're chasing glory all the time and we chase so hard and you may be in the room having chased this and chased that and chased this and you're like you're worn out, you're tired. And frankly, you're kind of almost numb at this point. You wonder, is anything heavy? Does anything have any meaning? Because you've chased down so many things and they've turned out to be not that important in the end. Jesus' words put his disciples on the spot. It's actually, I want to put us on the spot with a question, and that is, is God's glory really driving my life? I mean, the weightiness of the infinite worth of God's perfections put on display on the cross, the resurrection of Jesus. Is that really driving your life? What if you began to reflect on that? When I mean the perfections of Jesus, the perfections of the Father, I do mean when you look to the cross, you are going to see perfect justice and you're going to see perfect goodness. When you look to the resurrection, you're going to see perfect sovereignty, perfect wisdom, perfect grace. All of these, all of these on display for us to see, is that driving? I don't know where you find meaning. I know there's a thousand places we could chase it. But what if we stop for a moment and realize, here's what gives my life meaning. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. That is worth living our lives for. That's worth, that, that will give our lives meaning. What if we're seeking our purpose? Like, why am I here? What, what difference can I make? What if we got a grip on this fact that the cross of Jesus Christ calls me to something much greater than I am? The good news that Jesus, in Jesus, God is reconciling a bunch of rebels to himself. And we are entrusted with sharing that message and living out that message as if it's made a difference in our life. That's a purpose that a thousand things you could chase will not give. It will never give. What if this became like the center point of our community, our partnership? What if we recognize we're gathered around people who share this in common? We're all about Jesus. We're all about him being glorified. It shows up. It shows up when we gather. It shows up in the rituals, the symbols we do. I mean, it's an odd ritual, if you think about it, to just dunk someone in water. But we're doing more than just an odd ritual. We are saying, just as Christ was buried and rose from the dead with new life, so I'm with him. I'm identifying with him when we take the Lord's Supper. It just really is common. It's just... You know, bread and juice, it's so common. And what we're saying is, I identify in this ritual. With this symbol, I identify with the one whose body was broken for me. The one whose blood was shed for me. Is God's glory driving your life? It's worth asking that question. It's worth probing that pretty hard. I promise you, there are many competitors to it. It's worth digging another layer deeper to go, is that really driving? What gives me meaning and purpose and community? And We sing of the cross. We sang of it a few moments ago. What he's done and our attention was like, we're going to look at the cross. We're going to do it every single week. We're going to sing about it. We're going to remind ourselves that that is what drives our life. You hear Jesus speak of glory, but let, let's keep reading. Because in verse 33, it does seem to change gears a little. Verse 33, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer, and then you'll look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so now I tell you where I'm going, you cannot come. So we'll talk about this further, but Jesus, Jesus braces his disciples. These are kind, compassionate words. He's bracing his disciples for terrible news. To them, anyway, it's a, like a total disaster. Jesus is leaving. Many of you, do, I mean, with Sean and I, we've had to commute. We had to communicate over the last eight to twelve weeks to a number of people very close to us. We're leaving, 
and Jesus is talking to disciples who are very confused by this. And there's a word of tenderness there. He calls them little children. So he's not just running over them. I mean, he's little children. Here's what's going to happen. Here's what you're going to need to know. And again, we'll dig into this further because he really gets into this in John 14. But in light of him leaving, in light of him saying, I'm going to go, and they're, they're going, this is, this is tragic. This is terrible news. In light of his leaving, Jesus says, verse 34, I am giving you a new command. Love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We've talked about glory, but can we talk about love? Jesus is seen in the love his disciples have for each other. We talked about glory and how God is like making his glory known, but now can we talk about Jesus who is seen in the love his disciples have for each other? Did you read? Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new command, all right? A new command. One of his disciples could have raised their hand and go, it doesn't sound very new, like Leviticus 19 says to love your neighbor. So you've, that's, is it new to say love each other, love one another? Even Jesus had spoken before this. He had said, yeah, that's the second greatest command, love God. And then there's another one just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus had even said on the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies. So what exactly is new about this? Jesus says, a new command I'm giving you. Okay, Jesus, what is new about this? I think a few things are new. So one of them would be, Jesus frames it in this way, just as I have loved you, now you love one another. Well, it is new in that God has come in flesh and loved his disciples, and there's a model and there's a pattern to follow. Think about the deep encounters the disciples had had with Jesus. I'm sure James and John and Peter and all of them could think of the dumb things they said in t- at, at times in front of Jesus, that Jesus was so patient with them. I think the disciples could go back to stormy nights on the Sea of Galilee, and they could remember Jesus' love and calming those storms and speaking to them. Sometimes we show love by believing in someone, by expressing confidence in them. Think about Jesus as he sent out his disciples two by two and like had, gave confidence in them. Think about Jesus taking a towel, taking a basin of water like we looked at last week and washing his disciples' feet. All these different ways Jesus now could say, You've seen that I love you. You've seen what it looks like to be loved perfectly. Now love each other. So that is one way it's new. There's other, there's other scholars that will say that word just as can also be translated because, and it is in the New Testament. So sometimes it, it could read this way, because I have loved you, you can love each other because you've experienced the love of Jesus. I mean, Paul would say it this way in 2 Corinthians, the love of Christ compels us like it. It drives us forward because we've been loved so well. We wake up with motivation. If I've been loved like this, if God has arranged all these circumstances to remind me again and again, not on my best day, on my worst days, he loved me so deeply. Then because he's loved me, I have power that otherwise I would not have. I have strength that I otherwise would not have because he has loved us. I think, though, there's one other element that makes this new. When Jesus says, love one another, I think what may actually be the implication of why it's so new and even why it's so hard is because at that point, there were 11 disciples in the room that were so, so different, and Jesus is saying, you're together now. You can do background studies on each of the disciples. What you will find is, even by their names, by those brief descriptions, you're going to find they were all over the map politically. You're going to find they're from different places geographically. You're going to find they had different backgrounds. One's a tax collector. One's called the zealot, like a revolutionary. They had different relationships with Rome, different relationships with uh, the, the law. I mean, all sorts of things. 
And Jesus brings those 11 guys together and says, your commission now is to love each other, a new command I'm giving you. Here's how we're going to do it. If you're the community of Jesus, he's going to bring together people that otherwise you'd walk in a room and go, how do all these people get together? Like, how is all this group, like, this group really together? And he's going to do it again and again and again and again. He's going to bring people together like that. Jesus fully intended that when we follow him, it's going to be a, a very diverse group. I'll think about it, the first church. So disciples here, like, make disciples of all nations. So they do. And Jew and Gentile have to come together, and he says, love each other. And different ethnicities within the Gentiles have to come together. And he says, love each other, bear each other's burdens, pray for each other, forgive each other. He takes the poor and he takes the rich and he brings them together. And he says, love each other. He takes the highly educated and the uneducated and he brings them together. And he says, love each other. He takes those who have all kinds of strength and those who are disabled and he brings them together and says, love each other. He takes the weak, the vulnerable, the strong in society, brings them together and says, love each other. He brings men and women together and he says, love each other. People different from you. So, Brander, I I look at this and I go, if Jesus can bring Jew and Gentile together, if Jesus can bring even those 11 disciples together, then do we not hear his voice in our ears saying, okay, You meet in different venues. You meet across different campuses. You have different musical preferences. You're different generations. Okay. Love each other. Love each other. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 13, there's faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. The first fruit of the Spirit that Paul would name, this is is the evidence of the Holy Spirit's work in our life. The first fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, the world, I find it can give give us tons of advice. Social media has no problem teaching us how to cultivate and create a community, really curate a community around us that looks just like us. You get pumped with all the things that you're interested in. All the technology just sends you more what you want, sends you more people that are just like you. And it's so easy. We, we like those people because they're just like us. They think like us. They, they process the world like us. And into that, you step into the world of John 13 and you hear a new command. It's hard to hear. At times, at times it's, it's much easier to be sold on Jesus, but really irritated with his followers. Much, much easier there. Sometimes we don't hear it. My wife's a... Sean is a preschool teacher, and sometimes she has to tell the preschoolers, like, are your listening ears on? Are your listening ears on? There's part of me that says, like, disciples, are your, li- are your listening ears on? I don't think they were, because Peter, you just keep reading to the end of the chapter. You know what Peter does? He changes the subject. Oh, Lord, can we go back to that place where you said you were, you were going to leave? I want to revisit that subject. Jesus has just given him a command. Peter's first thought is, like, can we go back to that? Other thing, and that's our impulse. Why are we far more interested in debating this, nuancing this, making sure those people have the right stance? I mean, why, why do we go there so quickly? Why are we interested in church politics and Bible studies when Jesus gives us this command? I do think we don't make it a priority. And I also think when we hear this love each other, I do think there's sometimes pain attached to it because some of you in this very room here, you have loved the believers. You have been a part of a diverse community that began to fracture and fall apart. And so your idea right now is understandable. You go, yeah, I tried that. But I kind of found out church is a contact sport and I got hurt. And by hurt, I mean... There are painful stories, bitter endings, brutal disappointments, and friendships ruined. And I kind of told myself, I don't think that I can lean into that anymore. I just want to call on all of us to take steps of faith. To believe Jesus really did know what he was talking about. He really did set up this community the way it's supposed to operate. And maybe you pray again like, Lord, 
I will lean into loving my brothers and sisters, but it's hard. Will you help me? And I think that would be a prayer Jesus would love to answer. As I read these words, as I read the very words of Jesus, I am really struck. I mean, this has been a pretty special season. So coming back to Chattanooga, I mean, coming back to Brainerd has been so, so special, but also the privilege of just being in this city, and it's a city that's easy to love. As we've, like, kind of gotten reunited with this city, I'm just, I really am amazed at all the people. It's at Erlanger Hospital, and I'm amazed at all the people. I've had plenty of time to sit at the 7524 split and think of all the people that seem to be in Chattanooga right now. I drive by townhouses and condos and this development and that development, and I think, like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm a part of a church. We're a part of a church that wants to be strategic. How do we love? How do we serve? How do we care? How do we show up? I'm assuming that God in his infinite plans is sending people from all over the country, all over the world even, to Chattanooga, to this area. And so I think we're all like, how, how are we strategic? How can we, how can we meet the need? How can we introduce Jesus to these people that God is sending to our area? And at the risk of oversimplification, I think I got step one. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples by the love you have for each other. So here's the question. Like, it's a specific question again. Where has Jesus called me to love my brothers and sisters? I would love to see Chattanooga under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Not just through Brainerd, but through so many churches in our area. I'd love for that to be like a dominant theme of God doing a special work in our area. Where do we start? Where has Jesus called me to love my brothers and love my sisters? Because there is something like, so yes, a relationship with Jesus is very personal. I agree. Like it gets into our thoughts, our motives, our fears, our, our hurts. Our worries, I mean, all, all these things, yes, it's very personal. But it's also meant to be very, very public. Like our walk with Jesus is meant to be public. So I want to flesh it out a little bit. Lest we kind of just leave it in generic terms, okay, Curtis, I got it. Well, we're supposed to love each other. I, I need to think maybe a little bit about how, how can I start doing that or do it more. Can I provide just a few pictures of what I think Jesus is talking about specifically? in a place like Chattanooga, Tennessee, with Brainerd Baptist Church. So imagine with me, again, let me sketch out some scenarios. Imagine with me, you're at a middle school soccer game. And there you are on the sidelines. It's raining. It's a little cold. Dad and mom are there. Grandma and grandpa are braving the weather. Beside this family is also another person. It's a single lady. She's friends of mom. But this lady has actually become part of the family. She's an adopted aunt to that kid, that 10-year-old, that 12-year-old playing soccer. Like, this lady speaks into the life of this whole family in such a powerful way. And as as everybody's kind of standing on, on the sideline, the game ends, there's high fives and there's hugs and there's cheering. They all go out to eat afterwards. And other parents on that sideline are thinking, like, man, it... What kind of adults do that? What kind of adults are interested in pouring their life, like showing up for a 10-year-old, for a 12-year-old? And you share like, yeah, they're from my church. She's from my church. She's kind of part of our family. Or another scenario here, imagine a man in his mid-30s who's just lost his dad. And the grief and pain is unbearable. But you, but you go to the funeral home, and, like, the funeral home's packed. There's all kinds of people there, and they're laughing, and they're crying, and they're hugging, and there's a sense that that man who has just lost the most valuable thing to him, one of the most valuable things in the world, is the furthest thing from alone that day. You look around, and there's unbelieving relatives going, like, who are all these people? For all these people that have showed up with meals and arranged details and helped out with childcare and sent flowers. And the answer comes, yeah, they're all from Brainerd. This is my church family. 
and that unbelieving relative has to go home with some questions. Like, who does that? Or imagine the person that just got transferred to Chattanooga, brand new to the area. They don't have family. They don't have connections. But they're followers of Jesus, and they're pretty immediately, imagine they're pretty immediately welcomed into the Brainerd family. So they join a life group. They come all the time. They become members. And again, they're brand new, but they're talking to coworkers one day and talking about some plans they have for the weekend. And the coworker kind of is thinking, like, how do you have so many friends with like you're always doing stuff on the weekend. How do you have so many friends? Like, I've been here all my life. I grew up here all my life, and I, I, don't, I feel isolated here. It's like, where, where, did you, where did you make connections so quickly? How do you get that close that quick? The person says, that, they're, they're from my church. Like, I was just welcomed in. Like, we had known each other all our lives. And then I do want you to think of that Christian student who's part of a group, part of a club, part of a youth group, part of a college ministry. And there's a group there where they meet and they laugh and they have a clear conscience at the end and there's no inappropriate sexual innuendos. Really thoughtful guys, really dependable girls. Nobody's interested really in using relationships. There's a deep care for each other. There's not a ton of gossip. And there are these university students or high school or middle school students that look in on that and go, where do you find love and acceptance like that? What? Maybe they even used to mock the, a Christian thing, but they look in and go, like, how, how does that even happen? And you say, well, actually, most of the people here are from my church. I think all of that gives us maybe the ears we need to hear the command of Jesus once again. Because I believe this is a commissioning This is a commissioning that Jesus is giving us, not just a command. Can we hear it one more time, and then I'll pray. Jesus says this in verse 34, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you're also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Can we pray? Father, you have loved us so much. So much that you sent your one and only son into this world. So now that we've seen that love and experienced that love, I pray that you would grow our ability, our strength to love others as we have been loved. For the person who has not yet tasted that, I pray that you will make our community together as a Brainerd family, just compelling. Christ's love would be seen in our interactions, not just today, but throughout the week. Lord, in doing that, we pray that the infinite worth of your perfections would go on display. We pray that you be glorified. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to stand. Let's sing. Let me be
our service. Pastor Curtis, thank you for that beautiful message to remind us how important it is to us to love each other as Jesus loved the church. Church, if you've made a decision today, uh, if you'd like for one of our pastors, for one of us to pray for you, we'll be around here in the front and the back. If you'd like to pray with a staff member, or if you've made a decision today that you would like to share with us, please find one of us and we'd be glad to pray for you. As we leave today, we leave you with the same benediction, the same blessing Every week from Psalm 67 says, may God be gracious to us and may he keep us, may he make his face to shine upon us so that his way may be known among all the earth and his salvation among all the nations. Church, go in peace. Have a great week. We love you. Have a great day.